Um, my name's Dave Sweeney. I, I uh, in my day job, uh, lead the ACF, the Australian Conservation Foundation's um, uh, nuclear free work. And um, today, along with a uh, friend and co-conspirator, Dimity Hawkins, I'm lucky enough to be um, uh, in conversation with these folks. Um, both Dimity and I are joining you today uh, from Wurundjeri lands of the Kulin Nation in Nam in Melbourne. Um, this town is currently COVID constrained, but its sovereignty was never ceded. And we pay our respects to elders and community past, present and emerging. And as, as we do, as we do more often now, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself and the country that you're on in the chat so we can share that. And it's also a really important recognition with this topic because you know, one of the things that informs nuclear free activity here and around the world is an awareness of the disproportionate impact uh, on Indigenous and First Nations people of the nuclear industry and also the lead role of Indigenous and First Nations people in resistance. Um, look, we've all been zooming now for probably far too long, for at least a while, we know the score, um, but just a reminder to uh, use the chat function to note any questions you might have or comments you might have for our guest today. And today, a little bit like uh, Ray and Scott's books, has some chapters, we've got an introduction, we've got some reading uh, from the authors, we've got some conversation and exploration about some of these themes with the four. And then we can go wider to, with a Q and A and a conversation as, to the extent and as best as one can with this technology, with all of us. And it will be an illuminating and an interesting time. This isn't a, um, a formal book week event. It's part of ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, part of the ICANN Band School Initiative. And ICANN was born here in Melbourne and launched here in 2007 before it went global later that same year. Um, both Dimity and I were fortunate enough to be part of that foundation process and time. And there's, uh, ICANN's idea was really basic. Like it was a huge appetite and a big idea, but it was a basic idea. It was to abolish nuclear weapons by making them illegal and advancing a global prohibition treaty. So now today, moving forward, nuclear weapons are illegal. There's a global treaty that pro prohibits these weapons of mass and indiscriminate destruction and support and strength for the treaty is growing. And along the way, ICANN collected the Nobel Peace Prize and dispensed not just the pathway, but perhaps more importantly, the hope that makes traveling that pathway possible. And in tough times like the ones we currently are in now, with a global pandemic, a, a climate diagnosis that is the red flag for humanity and the profound failure and tragedy that is Afghanistan today, hope is as vital or more vital than ever. And as our guests write about and live out, hope is not only essential, it's also effective. And it is daily fueling resistance and creation around the world on multiple levels, multiple issues, and in ways big and small. So the theme for the formal book week this year dovetails be beautifully with a lot of the themes that drive a lot of nuclear free work, our guests, and a lot of you. Um, it's the theme is old worlds, new worlds, other worlds. That's about dismantling some. That's about celebrating, respecting and protecting others. And it's about building new ones. So today, thanks for joining us. It's a gorgeous day in Melbourne. I hope it's a gorgeous or gentle day wherever you are and particularly to our Northern Hemisphere colleagues and comrades. Thanks for joining us after dark. Um, and let's get comfy and kick off. And we're going to kick off with Ray Atchison, um, reading from their new book, Banning the Bomb, Smashing the Patriarchy. Thanks, Ray.
Thanks so much, Dave. And thank you also to Jem and Dimity for organizing this and for putting it at a time that wasn't at 4 a.m. for me. I really appreciate everyone adjusting the band school time um, just to, to include me. Um, it's very I can of you and inclusive. Um, so I'm Ray. I think most of you probably know me, but I'm director of Reaching Critical Will, which is the disarmament program of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom which is the oldest feminist peace organization in the world, founded in 1915 with chapters um, and sections all over the world, including, of course, a very vibrant section in Australia. Um, and so we have a very storied history that I won't go into today, but our work on banning nuclear weapons has been part of Wilt's history um, and really uh, um, sort of a continuation of the work that, that women started in 1915. And uh, WILP was also, WILP women were involved in founding ICANN, of course. We have uh, Flick Ruby and Dimity Hawkins on the call and many others were involved in that effort. And so there's also lots and lots of connections between WILP and ICANN. And the reason that I wrote this book, Banning the Bomb, Smashing the Patriarchy, was to really give uh, the feminist perspective from Wilp and I can on the ban process. I wanted to tell a very particular story that's often overlooked and that will be written out of history unless we uh, ensure that it's included. Anti-nuclear organizing, of course, has a very long and rich uh, feminist uh, angle to it. Women have always been at the forefront of anti-nuclear organizing. And I just want to give a shout out to all of the um, events on this week to mark uh, the Greenham Common um, efforts by women in the UK and around the world to get um, nuclear missiles out. And I think Dimity is involved in some of those events, and I'm sure others on the call are as well. So um, that's another example of feminist work for nuclear disarmament in the past. And I also just really want to highlight in this part of my reading that I'm going to do, but also throughout our discussion, the importance of intersectional feminism, recognizing not just gendered impacts or the way that gendered norms and structures affect nuclear discourse and our attempts to disarm, but also how the colonial, imperial, and racist histories and current realities of nuclear weapons are all bound up with gender and with the structural obstacles that we face uh, in nuclear disarmament. And this analysis was really at the foreground of our advocacy for a ban, both by activists, of course, with ICANN, but also by a lot of the states that were involved um, who really saw this as a moment for them to stand up to the colonial powers and to those who wield massive violence in order to get their way in international relations. So this was reflected in the negotiations of the treaty, um, in the participation of who was in the room from ICANN's side, but also from the state side, and the importance then in learning from other social justice movements, making sure that we're always foregrounding lived reality and challenging long-held narratives about why the world is the way it is because we know that we're told all the time we can't change anything this is just how it is and how untrue that is and the band process really shows us a good example so i'm going to do a brief reading from an early chapter in the book um, and since the book uh, involves the word patriarchy, I'm going to unpack that just a little bit before I go into the reading. Um, when I'm talking about patriarchy and when feminists talk about patriarchy, we're not necessarily specifically talking about men and enforcing a dichotomy between men and women. But what we're talking about is constructions of masculinity, of what it is that we're taught, all of us, uh, what it means to be a real man, how these ideals are imposed upon all of us, and how the this binary between men and women, which is entirely constructed, enforces this idea of strong men who communicate through violence and passive women in need of protection. And there's no other real options for any of us to exist in this world unless we fall into one of those two categories. So I just wanted to put that out before I start the reading. As much feminist scholarship explains, social constructions of gender ascribe contrasting characteristics to masculinity and femininity that are seen as mutually exclusive and in which the masculine attribution is valued more highly than the feminine. 
And Flick Ruby, again, who I mentioned earlier, is on the call. Um, these are footnotes to some of her work. So if you read the book, you can get all the sources. Descriptors like strong and rational, serious and truthful tend to be associated with masculinity, while descriptors like weak and irrational and emotional and imaginary tend to be associated with femininity. So one of the tactics that was used by representatives of nuclear armed states to undermine the credibility of those who seek a ban on nuclear weapons was to assert that they didn't really understand international security and to accuse them of being, quote, emotional about nuclear weapons. When things like this were said in the conference room, I was reminded of a story that Carol Cohn relayed in an article in the 90s. She explains that a white male physicist working on modeling nuclear counterforce attacks exclaimed to a group of other white male physicists about the cavalier way that they were talking about civilian casualties. Only 30 million, he burst out. Only 30 million human beings killed instantly. The room went silent. He later confessed to Carol, nobody said a word. They didn't even look at me. It was awful. I felt like a woman. This association about caring about the murder of 30 million people with being a woman is all about patriarchal gender norms. It's about seeing that position and seeing women as being weak and about caring about the wrong things letting your emotions get the better of you, focusing on human beings when you should be focused on strategy and statesmanship. In this perspective, caring about the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons is feminized, it's weak, and it's not relevant to the job that quote unquote real men have to do to protect their countries. Most of the nuclear armed states asserted this very clearly and repeatedly in their opposition to banning nuclear weapons. Disarmament is thus constructed as a utopian vision of a world that can't exist, because the argument goes that there will always be those who want to retain or develop the capacity to wield massive, unfathomable levels of violence over others. Therefore, the rational actors need to retain the weapons for protection against the irrational others. In this context, policy decisions are based on conceptions of power imbued with mistrust, threat, fear, and violence. Such policies do not allow for other types of international engagement or relationship between citizens and states. They dismiss alternatives as utopian and unrealistic. This is more than just an argument or a difference in opinion. This is an attempt to undermine and discredit the other's perspective in order to maintain power and privilege. This attempt to control reality, which is known as gaslighting in psychological terms, is as integral to patriarchy as it is to nuclear deterrence. When the majority of states and international activist organizations all say that nuclear weapons threaten us and must be eliminated, the nuclear armed states say that nuclear weapons, in their hands, of course, keep us all safe and they must retain them indefinitely. When it's pointed out that nuclear armed states haven't complied with their disarmament commitments, the representatives of these countries claim that they have. They've done everything that they possibly can, and now it's up to the rest of the world, particularly those countries without nuclear weapons, to create the conditions for any further disarmament efforts. So the book goes on and on with more examples from there of all of the gaslighting tactics, the victim blaming, um, the pulling the wool over the eyes, um, speaking the opposite of what is true. Um, but this idea that it's up to the rest of the world to create the conditions for disarmament really um, went to the heart, I think, of what states did with the ban treaty. Um, you know, fine, put the ball in our court. We're going to ban the bomb. That's what we're going to do with it. And these countries working with ICANN and with other international organizations like the ICRC, with survivors and other groups around the world, really created something from nothing over the objections of the most powerful, um, you know, measured in, in their terms of power over their objections and over their um, attempts to quash this entire process. So Dave talked a lot about hope in his opening remarks. And I think that's incredibly important for the way that we look at the ban treaty and the way that we look at the path forward from here, because of course we still have much work to do to abolish nuclear weapons. But the fact that we now have this treaty, um, despite everything that they've tried to throw at us should give all of us great hope for the future. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ray. That's fantastic. And the book is wonderful in how it weaves that personal story and the interplay with the institutional political play around this and, and how it foregrounds that lived reality. Um, we'll come back and unpack, but first let's move on and Scott Ludlam. I could ask you to share um, with us a reading from your book, Full Circle. Hey everyone, good morning and good evening if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, my name is Scott. I am speaking to you from um, Duranganj country, um, the Duranganj people of the UN nation on the south coast of New South Wales. I'm on a little bit of a sketchy satellite connection so if it cracks up i'll drop the video just so that you can at least hear me um but i do want to acknowledge that i'm speaking to you from unceded ground and recognize not just the continuing custodianship of aboriginal people in this part of the world and around the world um but their enduring um resistance to the nuclear industry out of which nuclear weapons come um, and the reading that I'm going to do from the book recognizes um, the, the very profound and real implications of that resistance that have kept the rest of this society safe from this technology, even if we don't all know it. Um, I, I also want to acknowledge while we're at it, like there's, in, there's some really incredible people on this call. I've just been scrolling through some of the folks like I mean, even having Ray here as a guest, even though it's quite late in the evening in North America, is a real treat. But there's there's and there's also um, folk who have been profoundly important in the history of ICANN um, and the and the antecedents to that. So I just want to acknowledge that everybody on this call for all the work you've already done um, that got us to this point. ICANN changed international law. It changed the world and I think most importantly it changed people's understanding and perception of what's possible in this space by just going ahead and doing it and so thank you to everybody who's been such a huge part of that um, this is a thing that I made with an enormous amount of help including from lots of folk on this call it's called full circle it came out in May um, and it's in part a, a a record of how social movements succeed or fail. So my background um, is not as a writer. Um, I spent um, nine years in the Australian Parliament. Before that, I was working on anti-nuclear campaigns, more or less full time. And I'm fascinated by the dynamics by which social movements can succeed or can fade away. The crossover between organic grassroots movements and formal politics and institutional politics. ICANN is a really interesting example of that because it came from the grassroots, it came from the ground up, and then it ends up holding court in the United Nations General Assembly and pushing over a really important um, domino in the relationships between states. Um, there's a lot in the book about scale. Um, we're probably all familiar with this, this metaphor, this idea of the butterfly wings of how small causes can have enormous consequences. We see that over and over again in movement organizing and in social movements. So I want to actually look at, well, what, what's that about? Apart from just a pretty metaphor, um, how, how can we be the butterfly that the, the wing beats stir up the storm? Um, how do we what can we learn from successful butterflies of past storms? Um, I discovered all this stuff with Flick's help that sociologists and movement historians and theorists have written about how social movements are adaptive, how the claims that they make on power structures lead to pushback. When you have a win, there'll almost always be a reaction that's going to push you back a couple of steps. And you won't be able to succeed again by trying the thing that just succeeded. We have to continually adapt and surprise and be creative. And there's a surprising, um, a surprisingly large literature of people who've kind of been fooling around and playing with that idea of adaptive campaigning and adaptive social movements about how we continually stay a step ahead. Um, it's a more creative and, and 
loving version of the idea of an arms race that we're in we're in a form of a of a loving arms race with extremely well armed and violent institutions um and so that that kind of draws in the sense of the importance of of creativity and experimentation so to get there there's a lot of systems theory where again i think there's some really valuable um disciplines and understandings of how um, dynamic systems in contention work, movement history, sociology, lots of case studies. And one of them is a case study um, close to home of an organization that's today called ANFA, the Australian Nuclear Free Alliance, which is one of the best examples I know of, of a collaboration of red, black and green that's gone on now. It had its 20th anniversary in 2017. Um, that has been powerfully successful in bringing this, the stories, the organizing culture the, and, and community structure of the oldest living societies on the planet and kind of hybridizing those in a really interesting way with greeny environmentalism um, and, more, and, and more kind of city-based NGOs in a really productive and powerful partnership. So I'm gonna read a couple of little snippets from an essay called Campfire um, that is relaying a little bit of the work of ANFA and all the things that it's taught me. Um, is the signal okay or am I glitching and being annoying? Thumbs up, okay, okay, that's good. All right, so this is an essay of a little over halfway through called Campfire. <clears throat> I'm still not used to reading. It still feels weird to be reading out of a book, but okay, here we go. A crackling campfire in an old steel drum. Conversation and laughter that will ebb and flow while the stars turn far above. The old people in camp chairs with mugs of tea, holding not just the memory of the 20 years we're celebrating tonight, but the whole history of this thing right back to the beginning. Tobacco passed hand to hand with story and laughter and loss. A couple of empty chairs, imagining them occupied by the ones we miss from campfires past. This extended family is starting to lose track of how much harm and destruction it has seen off. Radioactive waste dumps, domestic and international, from the Barclay to the Flinders Ranges. Persistent and increasingly shrill gambits for new Fukushimas. Uranium mines from Akarula to the Gulf Country to the gold fields. The background radiation to this whole story is the time the colonizers bombed them off their lands with actual nuclear weapons. The Commonwealth government with unlimited access to broadcast networks, lawyers, cops, multinational mining corporations with 11 digit market capitalization, footloose junior explorers awash with careless investors cash. Again and again, the most powerful entities in the country have trespassed on these people's traditional lands, seeking to poison and dump, extract and destroy. More often than the odds should favor, they end up retreating in humiliation. I would never ever bet against these people. Dave Sweeney has spent 30 years working on these campaigns, 20 of them as the Australian Conservation Foundation's nuclear campaigns coordinator. I ask what he thinks the secret is. Quote, there's a bit of craft, there's a bit of leverage, there's a bit of pressure, and there's a bit of magic, he observes, and things always look impossible just before they become self-evident. So that's all I'm gonna to read today. Um, this is available now published by Black Ink, but I'm interested to tease out the craft, the leverage, the pressure, and certainly the magic that ICANN has brought to bear um, since it upended disarmament diplomacy. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, Scott Ludlam, you've uh got me a little bit teary there and just for folks there was no cash comment that wasn't um a pre-arranged exit um thanks scott that's fantastic and i also want to shout out before we go on i want to shout out and echo what scott said about this group today um uh, i stopped uh reading the list because um plato said many years ago that an uneducated or rather an ignorant audience is a speaker's greatest comfort. And so there's a high level of discomfort if you're speaking today, because this is an audience of people who know their stuff, who care about their stuff and have changed things 
and I'm honoured that we're all in here together. And I really want to shout out to all the people, ICANN board, staff, founders, funders, all the people from a whole range of organisations and places that over years um, have done amazing work and are the coral reef that we just keep building on and growing on and sharing our experiences from. So thank you all. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Ray. Now, before we get into the content, and there's plenty, I want to sort of, you know, um, start us off maybe a little bit more gently in one sense. I want to ask both of you, and I'd like to start with you, Ray, if, um, you know, like writing, um, I do 700 word pieces, bang, hit send. But writing, like seriously, to write a book is um, like that's deep thinking. It's quite deep time. I imagine it's quite solitary. I imagine you have a love-hate relationship with it. I imagine you speak to people and they go, oh, the book. Um, but I imagine it is often internal world. And then suddenly it's that are and you're on Zoom or in places where you can, you're at bookshops and it's out in the external world. I wanted to hear your observations about that. And I particularly was hoping that you might both be able to share with us how you felt when you first saw it and when you first picked it up as an item, not an idea, but a turn the page item. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dave. So um, there's a little bit of a funny connection between my book and Scott's book, which is um, they were both written in the same shed uh, surrounded by lawnmowers and spiders at Flixland. Um, the, that's where I wrote the first, most of the first draft of, of my book. And I also plotted out a rough um, sketch of the book there with Dimity and Flick um, on, a, on a writing retreat. Um, <laughs> yes, in which writing should be um, interpreted as meaning many different things. But um, being in Australia when I was in those formative days of the book was really useful, of course, because so many of the ICANN founders were available to speak to and um, being on country, going on radioactive exposure tour at the same time that I was really starting out writing this book uh, was just really instrumental to, to a lot of the framing and, and crafting of it. Um, I also write a lot of short pieces normally. Uh, I do, you know, coverage from the United Nations from different conferences and I put them out at 2 a.m. and sometimes they're great and sometimes I wake up the next morning and think, oh no, what did I say? Um, and very few people get to edit them, if anybody, because of the time. So this process of writing a book and going through stages of editing, sending around chapters to people, getting feedback, and then having the professional editors at the publisher look at them too, that was a much more extensive drawn out process. Um, and so that I think was the trickiest thing for me that I was still working on this project. Um, over you know a two and a half year period where I'm used to just banging things out really, really quickly and moving on to the next thing. Um, so that was probably the hardest part for me, but I do love writing. So I enjoyed the process and, um, and the crafting of that. And then when I got the book, um, a lot of people had it before I did. <laughs> so it was nice to already see people sharing it on Twitter and um, promoting it that way and, and um, being really celebratory of it. But when I got it, um, yeah, it was, it was a lot heavier than I thought it would be. I think there are a lot of footnotes. So if you do get it and it looks really big, don't worry because most of it is footnotes and an index and uh, a bibliography. That's like a third of the book. So it's much shorter than it seems. Um, but it was amazing to see it uh in in real life for sure and to see everybody's um blurbs in it including from dave and scott um and flick and others probably that are on this call so thanks to everybody who did that as well well thanks to you for the heavy lift and what about you scott Ludden? um well there's less spiders in the uh, in the shed now it's a it's it's probably a little bit comfier than it was when you were there but um yeah i'm i'm here um and the, the whole reason that i'm speaking from here probably rather than wa or somewhere else in the world is the generosity of flick who created a space here for, for a writer's retreat for for rayo and then for for me um and i just happened to have stuck around 
it is a it is a solitary thing dave as you've suggested it's kind of almost meditative apart from the really frustrating well probably including the really frustrating parts but um there's a thousand voices in here the acknowledgement section at the end of the book is ridiculous because of how many people it takes to create a book so it's my name on the cover and literally hundreds of other people who made it possible without whom it's just a pamphlet i'd only ever written essays before as well so i had no idea what to expect i was delusional about how long it was going to take i promised flick i'd be here for three months and then it took and then it took two and a half years um and and many edits and i probably could have kept going but at some point you just have to stop and say all right let's just hit print and um, see what people think. The first time I saw it, uh, I was in the car park of the co-op in Cabago with the manager of the co-op there. Cabago is the small town that was smashed very hard on New Year's Eve um, in the um, the bushfires of, of uh, a year and a half ago, um, half the town burned. and. So quite a bit of the book is dealing with the bushfires and what they told us about this, this, you know, the disposition of power in this country. So it felt kind of moving to be snapped uh, um, by Dan in a co-op car park with me kind of opening the box and seeing these things for the first time. And it still feels weird that it's a physical artifact. Well, I'm going to take over now for a second and ask you both. It's so lovely to be here with you both. I know that I spoke to you each at the beginning of your writing journey, and I spoke to you throughout your writing journey, and I was probably one of those annoying people who kept saying, how's it coming? How's it coming? Because it was much easier to do that than to uh, actually write, as we all know. Um, but it's wonderful that, you, that you've got them. And the first time I held your books in my hand, I was quite overwhelmed. And, and I've just been overwhelmed reading through them as well. So thank you both for all of the work that went into those. Um, Gem's put in the, in the chat there for you people um, how to order the books in case you haven't got them already. What are you doing if you haven't got them already? Come on now, get them. Um, I have a question for you both, um, though, as a student of history myself, like I'm often surprised at the work that needs to go into um, the uncovering of histories. And as a student of nuclear history in particular, I know that nuclear amnesia is really rife everywhere. It seems like state and military secrecy around these issues and the opaque records and the big money that's involved in nukes, as well as deliberate obfuscation, all are playing a part in that. And I think also that as activists, we're drawn into the immediacy of the work, the rush of the action and the reaction that sort of takes up so much of our time. And we rarely get the chance of reflection and capturing of our stories. So that's one of the reasons why these books have meant so much to me. They really capture our stories, our histories and her stories as well. Um, you mentioned this, Ray, right at the beginning when you said that we'd be written out of history if we didn't write these histories. And I think in your book, Scott, you talk about historical amnesia and you have a quote there from Milan uh, Kandira from Czechoslovakia, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. So how important, if you could just expand on that, how important was pushing back against our own nuclear and historical amnesia for you both in deciding to write these books? I guess I'll go. <laughs> um, well, I think in addition to the to the broader collective amnesia, there's also our own amnesia that is, um, you know, really hard to contend with too. As this was a process that took place over ten years, and so um, it's difficult to capture everything. And so for that, you know, in the in the acknowledgments of my book, I I point out that this is one telling of the story. There are probably many, many tellings of this story. Um, but also I had the great fortune of um, Tim Wright from ICANN Australia, who's also on the call, going through very carefully through the first draft and pointing out, hey, what about this and what about that? And then things I'd just forgotten that had slipped my mind that got then inserted into later drafts. So that was absolutely crucial, having that collective memory of, of what took place. And then more broadly, uh, it's, it's always interesting to me 
um, some of these stories and approaches and analysis that uh, we incorporate into our into our everyday advocacy within ICANN or within WILP or whatever group we're with, um, it becomes uh, reflexive to us and we stop we tend to stop going into the details because we assume that other people have this shared knowledge and history. Um, and then it's it's always striking to me when people say, oh, I've never thought of it that way before. I've never heard that before. I didn't know that piece of history. And so having other people that weren't really involved in the process also read the book um, and give those reflections was super important along the way. And it really highlighted to me again and again, the importance of no matter how many times we think we've heard the story, we have to keep telling it. Otherwise it will be completely written out. And um, I think that we can learn a lot uh, here from other um, social justice movements where things have been lost or uh, oral traditions and in indigenous communities where things have been retained for much longer than in our written histories. So there's all sorts of different um, practices that we need to be playing with, I think, to make sure that the real history uh, is not uh, overwritten by those uh, with the power of their pen, uh, which is guided by their missiles, basically, so. So true, so guided by their missiles. Uh, Scott, what about you? I wasn't sure if where, where exactly that was going. Um, the, I feel like I've had the um, real good fortune, I think a few folk on this call have as well, of having directly heard testimony from Hibakusha, from people who have been um, subjected to uh, nuclear weapons attacks. So um, one of the one of the ICANN partners, Peace Boat, has a project called Orozuru Project, which is just dedicated to making sure that people can listen to the direct testimony of those who've been um, in a nuclear attack. Their purpose is so that such a thing never happens again. And it occurred to me when I was um, being told one of these stories on Peace Boat um, by Mr. Miyake that this concept of collective species-wide memory is tremendously powerful, I guess, in two dimensions for the purpose of this conversation. Firstly, that um, there was a, a quite a deliberate effort after the Second World War by the occupying government to just prevent word of what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki from getting out. Um, so it was actually difficult to establish and it took the work of the Hibakusha over three generations or four now to make sure that that story was told with integrity. Um, so there's some pieces in the book about that sense in which without collective memory, we're just, uh, we're completely unable to collectively defend ourselves against powerful institutions. And related to that, I guess, is that movement history gets erased in, in a process that's, that's um, you know, just as creepy that social change can be understood uh, as something that's handed down by benevolent elites, or if we voted for the right politician, they will give us these freedoms. And that's not how social change is done ever, anywhere, in any context. It's hard fought. And generally the people who, who did the work do get written out of history. So um, yeah, without that collective memory, we're helpless and we're significantly more powerless. Indeed, we are. That is, that is great. The power of their pen is guided by their missile is just great. I've got my next Herald Sun letter to the editor. Um, the, um, thanks for that. I'm, I'm interested in, in then from, from the big picture of that to how did both of you, what was it that, that um, the experience or the issue that, that sort of uh, focused your considerable skills and those skills could have been applied to change in many areas, but there's a very strong nuclear free, anti-nuclear focus. What was the, the issue or the experience that, that brought that degree of, of clarity in, in your thinking? Maybe Scott, you could kick us off on that. All right, because mine's, mine's pretty quick. For me, it was the Jabaluka campaign in 97, 98, because as a confused, pretty apolitical, fellow who hadn't done any kind of social change work and was basically coming to environmentalism from a very, very kind of white perspective, 
Jabaluka was the first thing that cemented myself in my mind as wrong, as completely unambiguously, unarguably wrong. I, I didn't realize until I got up there that it was a land rights campaign. I thought it was a, an environmental campaign, but um, that, that was what lit the fuse for me. Visiting Kakadu, getting on country, listening to Yvonne Margarula, uh, and understanding just exactly what they were up against. And then they won. Then they won. Um, Kakadu's, you know, those mineral leases are being reincorporated back into Kakadu National Park. Not only do, do people stand up to stuff, they can win. So yeah, I was hooked. Fantastic. And on that note, I'd just really like to shout out to Gunjaitme Aboriginal Corporation, Kirsten Blair from BAC is on this call, but Gunjaitme and the Mira people and Australian First Nations people are literally at the forefront. They're spearheading this resistance. And as Scott says, um, in a non-violent way, routinely punching above their weight and bringing home protections and, and uh, safety for country and culture right across this land. And, in many other places in the world. So big shout out to, to them today. Um, Ray, what about yourself? What, uh, not necessarily the single issue, it might be as specific as Scott's, but the general sense and, and the issue or an experience that drew you to this work. Yeah, I came to anti-nuclear work through other social justice uh, movement work. So anti-war work, and anti-prison work actually was um, were things that I was doing in high school in my early uni years. And uh, then I met a woman named Randy Forsberg, who was one of the leaders of the nuclear freeze movement in the US in the 1980s. And um, she taught me a lot about the history of anti-nuclear organizing. And through her, that was how I got interested uh, sort of sideways into, into nuclear weapons from more broader anti-war work and, and abolition work for other structures of violence. Um, and seeing nuclear weapons as kind of a pinnacle uh, of, of atrocity and violence um, in our world, the way that we shape the way that we interact with each other, what we spend our money on, how we govern societies and international relations and looking at how nuclear weapons affect everything else, including all of our mindsets. Um, so that was how I came into things. And then I, I stumbled across WILP and um, started as an intern and never left. So thanks for that, Flick. Uh, thank you, Ray, for being at WILP for now. It's more than 15 years now, isn't it? 16, maybe now? It's 16 years that you've been reporting for Reaching Critical Will. That is just incredible and really driving that work at the UN. So big congratulations on that to you. Um, I just want to remind people that we're, we're going to have a little bit more conversation between us um, and then we'll very nicely share with all of you. So if you've got questions, please start putting them into the chat and we'll try and keep across those as well. But my next question is for the two of you again. Um, You've both traveled really widely around the world and you've also both visited each other's spaces. You've, Ray, you've come to Australia, as you said before, and um, had opportunities to sit down and visit many of the activists here, but also sit down on country to um, come on Rad Tour with uh, Friends of the Earth and some of us from ICANN as well. You've visited nuclear sites and US bases here. And Scott, you, when you were in New York, you were in New York at the time with Ray, at the time that the uh, TPNW was finally negotiated. So I'm kind of curious about what you both learned from stepping into each other's worlds a little bit here from across the globe. What did you learn that was kind of interesting stepping into those two worlds? My, my most significant memory of being in Ray's world was that on the day the vote went through, Ray had orchestrated for it to happen on her birthday. And for me, that takes real skill to land multinational negotiations with dozens and dozens of countries birthday so that you can go out to karaoke. I just thought that's organizing. That was, that was brilliant organizing. Well done, Ray. <laughs> Absolutely. What about you, Ray? 
Um, <laughs> yes, very good organizing, um, indeed. And I guess I would have to say that um, one of my favorite things that I've learned from all the time I've spent in Australia is how impressive um the direct action is in australia and how hilarious the direct action is in australia also i have um helped to kick apart a model nuclear bomb in the desert outside of a u.s military base um i've i've what else have i done oh dress up in a red jumpsuit in a missile park um and like do a rant for a, a video on twitter um all of these i should know i've done with gem and dimity and tim so there is a common thread as well um in this work but yeah i'm just always so impressed at the creativity and the humor that um australian activists bring to this work and i think that it is absolutely imperative in order to keep the work going because that's what really holds community together and makes makes us all feel more resilient and like we're doing something that is possible yeah beautiful one of the i can sort of mantras is humor humanity hope um and i think that um really really works um that's great and thanks for being such a generous sharer with your present right on your birthday sharing it with the rest of us that's like very hobbit like and very appreciated thank you i'm keen to just follow up this um the travel sort of idea because both of your worlds are big uh, maybe momentarily just geographically more confined to a postcode but they're big worlds you move a lot um ray the world often comes past you um stay in the one place long enough and they visit through the un and through so many other networks that you're plugged into globally and scott you've traveled extensively and particularly that informs and it's braided through full circles and reflections on those travels and those experiences i suppose again for for both of you i'm interested in from those ranges or that range of experience and people and and access can you just share maybe one or two i'm not talking favorite that that the threshold bar is too high with favorite it's not a sunday magazine list just one or two people or incidents or places or struggles that really stand out for you or seem to you yeah i guess um for me in the us in terms of of places um i'm always quite drawn to new mexico it is the birthplace, of course, of the atomic bomb. Um, I mean, so many, I shouldn't really say that because it's uranium from Canada and DRC and it's, uh, you know, the British were involved, the Canadians were involved. Um, the Some of the first um, steps were taken in Manhattan, which is why it was called the Manhattan Project. So it is a big, a big network, but of course they, they built Los Alamos in New Mexico. They tested the bomb in New Mexico. Um, the, you know, then there's two nuclear labs, many military um, bases, um, and it's it's an it's a colonized a nuclear colonized state really within the United States and um, has all of these economic disparities where you have Los Alamos County, one of the richest counties in the United States, and then um, everyone outside, you have the, the highest, among the highest rates of illiteracy, of childhood mortality, of drunk driving, of drug addiction, um, and of poverty, and of police brutality of anywhere in this country. So it's just this incredible example of what happens when you prioritize uh, nuclearism and militarism over everything else. And it, I think it's a warning to um, the rest of this country and also to the rest of the world of what happens when, when that's what you do. But then there's also extraordinary activism happening here and really incredible uh, art as well. And so um, there's uh, in a um the institute for indigenous art in santa fe there's an incredible exhibit on right now that is voices from australia and canada and kazakhstan and japan and marshall islands and 
um, Greenland, um, just different perspectives on the nuclear age and, and the impacts of nuclear weapons and, and that reality. And it stands in such stark contrast to the celebration of the bomb that you will see at the Nuclear Science Museum or the Space Museum and, um, and everything else. Even the UFO Museum in Roswell celebrates nuclear weapons. So, you know, there's, it's just, it's just really incredible. And so just, and there's so many activists here like the Los Alamos Study Group and others that are doing incredible work to, to try and um, to try and deal with the mess that exists in New Mexico. So that that I think would be an example that's top on my mind at the moment. But there are so many more. And if I could create a list, Dave, of favorites, I would need more time. Well, we've got a second book on the way there, on the way there Ray, I reckon. Um, could be a very good list. Scott? Um, one that's coming to mind for me, I, I had the opportunity to go back to a place called Jadagoda, which is in Jharkhand, so the eastern, uh, an eastern state in India, the poorest state in India. It's where nearly all of the uranium extraction um, that the Indian government does, it's almost all state owned, happens in this quite small concentrated area. And the main processing plant is, is right on the outskirts of a little village called Jadagoda. I visited there in 1999 and went back again 19 years later and um, was shocked by, so this is the worst case scenario, I suppose, of unregulated uranium mining where the workforce is treated as completely disposable. There's an epidemic of, of cancer, of um, reproductive diseases, of um, uh, childhood, um, you know, mutations and abnormalities. It's the, it's as, bad as you can imagine a uranium mine in a really fertile farming area would be. And um, that's been fought. It's also on Aboriginal land. Um, it's on tribal or Adivasi land in India. And so you've got all these kind of layers of, of um, you know, of, of, of class, of ethnicity, and of the, the kind of nuclear weapons overlay um, laid over the top of all of that, where if you resist this thing, you're treated as a foreign infiltrator interfering with the nuclear weapons program. And the resistance there has been astonishing. And even noticing in the 19 years between visits um, that they are more organized, they're much more confident. They, um, the first time I went there, I was smuggled in in the back of a taxi. The second time they organized a parade. Um, it was all the way out in the open. So even under the most adverse situation and circumstances you can imagine, um, in the poorest state, in one of the you know most poverty stricken um, parts of the world, the, the organizing and in, in kind of collective self-defense is incredibly strong and powerful and enduring. And in some ways had more structure and was better resourced the second time I visited than the first. That's fantastic. It's it's so amazing to hear those those two different parts of the world, and yet very familiar here too. Those stories as well, and and that ongoing kind of struggle that is happening everywhere around the nuclear industry. Um, I wanted to ask another question. I think this might be my last question for our little shared conversation. Then Dave might have one to wrap up, and then we'll ask you all to jump in with your questions. So pop them in the chat. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about how these are such complex and conflict driven times. And I think as activists, we've all faced backlash for standing up on issues and we've been deliberately misrepresented and undermined. Your great chapter title, um, Ray, Terminally Unserious, uh, is a great example of the kinds of attempts to belittle and degrade the work, you know. Um, but as, as Flick um, was so instrumental in forming for us, as Dave mentioned before, the humor, horror, hope kind of mentality around ICANN was, was sort of established early on. So I wanted to sort of go back to that um, humor for a second and ask you both, what's the funniest insult that the forces have ever tried to throw at you? And how do you then combat the nonsense that they throw at you and maintain your equilibrium? Which of you would like to go first? Um, I can go. I was actually going to call the book Terminally Unserious, but Dave and Scott literally sat me down and said I couldn't do that. 
And so then I went with banning the bomb, smashing the patriarchy. I didn't ask them what they thought of that. Um, so yeah, they like it. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, well, that was, that was obviously one of my favorite insults was, was that we were terminally unserious. There have been so many though, um, uh, from Russia once said that we had, um, or not just ICANN, but states too, that had, that supported the ban, um, had shot off to another planet or outer space. Um, that's a direct quote uh in a conference room um and you know so there's there's these funny things that come up of course all the time and you can laugh at them and ridicule them um and uh and you know have a joke about them afterwards but the problem is is that they're reflective of of the dominant thinking right that we are ridiculous and that none of this is meaningful and that we're all just fooling ourselves and uh we see it on twitter all the time we see it um Every time that a, a small state ratifies the TPNW, all of these people come out and say, oh, so-and-so is proclaimed it's not getting nuclear weapons. I feel so much safer. And the racism and colonialism that are inherent in those comments and um, in, the, in the patronizing patriarchal uh, way that our efforts have been dismissed are very serious and do need to be confronted. But I think confronting them with humor and with hope um, is is our best way forward. And so um, I think in that sense, the founding documents of, of ICANN uh, remain spot on to this day and, and just so crucial for, for overcoming that and for reminding each other also all the time that no, actually we did do this and it is meaningful. And you know, those of us who've worked on this for, for decades need to be reminded of that. And that's really where the importance of community in all of this comes in. Because if you're just dealing with insults by yourself, um, you'll eventually give up, I think. So true, Ray. And I think this morning there was a conversation with some Greenham women and we were talking about that internalizing of smallness that they kind of throw at us all the time, trying to say that we're too small, that we don't count that small states don't count, that, you know, small communities don't count. So, um, yeah, beautifully said. What about you, Scott? What's the weirdest and most outlandish of the insults that have ever been thrown at you? And how do you keep your equilibrium? They don't tend to come my way. Like, I'm a straight white male politician. And so there's not a lot that, that they can chuck. My, my favourites are the the things they throw at you that are true, but they're saying it like it's a bad thing. Those are definitely my favorites. This, I came across this interview with, between Matt Canavan, the kind of the former minister for coal and some weird little creepy crawly on Sky News. And they're just kind of seething at each other at four o'clock in the morning or whatever it is that they're doing. And Canavan sort of my drop up is that these people who what they really want is system change what they really want is to overthrow capitalism and they're kind of winding each other up in this feedback loop of outrage and it was just like fuck well yes actually um you're saying that as though that's a bad thing and that that kind of happens a lot that, that every now and again they accidentally read us right absolutely um that's that's fantastic and and i also got to share one other thing um that um that scott one of the many great pieces of advice that he gave me was never read the comments just put it out there and keep moving on and don't go down the toxic trail of people who say all that stuff to try and smash and undermine as you so well put um ray um look a lot of this talk um so so far a lot well a lot of the theme has been around um, not giving up, about agency, about reclaiming agency and cementing some agency. It's been about how smaller actors can have big impacts. I suppose it's a bit of a sort of um, obvious thing, but I'm really interested to see both of your views on the, the importance of, of people engaging and, and the importance of people engaging um, and overcoming. Um, maybe sometimes self-imposed barriers to engagement. Now, I don't just mean in nuclear politics, but in any social change. 
I've been really inspired by um, a lot of what's been taking place in the US over the last uh, year and a half. Um, you know, with the pandemic um, lockdowns then um, bursting into the very vibrant Black Lives Matter protests that have happened um, all of last Northern Hemisphere summer and, and well into winter of, um, you know, coming out of just relentless police brutality for decades and decades and decades. And I think it's another excellent example of the people in the movement know these stories, they know the context, they've been saying it and saying it and saying it, and they've been saying that abolish the police, defund the police, these are um, the solutions. And for so many people across the United States, um, this was the first time they were hearing these ideas. And um, that to me was a really good lesson in how we have to keep um, keep promoting our our truths and our worldview um, because we never know when it's going to suddenly be in the New Yorker and the New York Times um, and uh, when it's going to be an opportunity for people to engage with in their daily lives. Um, and it's also watching, of course, then the, 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 the cries for abolish and defund to then be turned into this reformist agenda. And it's the same thing that we see all the time with like nuclear arms control, right? Like, oh yes, we eventually want to abolish nuclear weapons. That's fine as a long-term goal, but how about we just tweak a little bit with the arsenal right now, whilst we actually invest more in nuclear weapons, which is what's happening, um, you know, with some of the reform agendas uh, with, with police, say with body cameras or training. Um, we don't need more nuclear weapons to be safe and secure. We don't need um, more money to go into these structures of violence, whatever it is. Um, but I think that I think that this is the type of engagement and dialogue that has been so energizing to see and pe seeing people on the streets um, between Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion over the last couple of years, um, doing so much direct action uh, around the world um, has just been really incredible and uplifting to me, even at the same time, of course, that it brings into such stark relief all of the power structures that we're up against and all of the, the forces of money and violence. Um, but I think we, we have a better sense, at least I have a better sense of the possibilities of, of collective action in this moment that maybe um, wasn't quite as visible um, in the past. And so that gives me a lot of hope as well. Yeah, I think one of my favorite examples just to pick up there is, well, recent examples anyway, is Extinction Rebellion and the way in which it's taken, you know, there's nothing new about sit-ins, there's nothing new about like high visibility, um, large scale organizing or occupations, but the this something that for some reason maybe accidental or partly by design or by accident caught a moment and then took off there was a there was a gap instead of having our demonstration against the coal industry at a power station 300 kilometers from the city we're going to have it in trafalgar square we're going to have our sit-in on broadway in sydney or we're going to have it where right in your faces in your bank's foyer where it's impossible to ignore and so I'm, I'm continually impressed and inspired by the things where somebody who didn't know if it was going to succeed or not, whether it be the school strikers or Extinction Rebellion or Me Too or Black Lives Matter, took a risk, did something that hadn't been done before in quite the same way. And then the next thing you know, there's 7 million school strikers or there's, there's XR groups all over the world who can't even speak the same language and yet are supporting each other's campaigns. Um, and again, I mean, not to keep going on about it, but ICANN is one of these fascinating examples of a moment of slippage, kind of walked through a gap that others hadn't realized or acknowledged was there. And the next minute you're at the table where they least want you to be. So that, that I think is where we have to look. It's like, what are the, what are the innovations or the stuff that's coming from the margins, not from the top down? Brilliant, brilliant. And, you know, feel free to keep talking about ICANN too, mate. That's all good. Uh, <laughs> um, it did grow off the, it did, you know, 
it did get built off the shoulders of giants before us, of course. You know, there's the, that is one of the really fundamental things about ICANN is that it's all the people who have done the work all over the world for sort of decades and decades. It was always a really essential part of it. Now, look, we're turning to questions. Um, we've got just a little bit of time left. So I'm going to ask the first one was um, right back at the beginning. This is from Kath. Um, Ray's definition of patriarchy was succinct. How important is a feminist approach to activism? And what are some of the key features of that organizing? Ray, would you like to answer that one? Sure, yeah. Thanks, Kath. Um, I think that... <laughs> Well, feminism is important for a lot of things, but uh, two main things that I'll talk about are unpacking myths and narratives and then uh, inclusivity and participation. So, and the unpacking stuff, it's really feminism throughout history has been about looking to lived reality and valuing that more than the assertions of straight white men in suits. Um, to generalize, uh, you know, the idea that uh, elites in conference rooms, regardless of, of gender or race, um, that their uh, understandings of how the world works or their interest in perpetuating how the world works um, has dominated for so long in in all fields this does not just relate to nuclear weapons of course um but then feminism in 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 what cynthia enlo calls the feminist curiosity this um this interrogation of uh well why does it work that way who's benefiting from that um what are other people who don't fit into this elite group doing um what do they think about it where's their place in the, in this big machine that we're all part of um and that that constant questioning and looking to what people in the world are actually experiencing in their daily lives and and putting that at the front and center of our analysis and our understanding of the world i think that is one of the most crucial things that um that a feminist tradition can can bring to this work i also think the other part of that then is the the intersectionality that i spoke of earlier this um this sense of inclusiveness and expansiveness of not narrowing the scope of who gets to be credible, but expanding that scope of who gets to speak, uh, whose views are important, um, who gets to be in the room is part of it in terms of diversifying participation, um, you know, not just women, of course, but non-binary, queer, racial diversity, disability diversity, class analysis, all of these things need to be brought in to the room. But I also think that it's about challenging what the room is. You know, it's not, I think the Red Nation has a saying that um, we don't want to sit at your table, we want to make our own table. And um, it's that kind of thinking that I think is, is really important. And I do think, this is something that I can and the and the non nuclear states working together really did in saying we're not going to operate in your forums where the nuclear armed states have a veto over over everything we're going to go to the GA the General Assembly we're going to vote. Um, we're going to make this participatory. Um, the one of the diplomats from Costa Rica said that the ban really brought democracy back to disarmament and it and it did in that in that frame. Um, and we need to, of course, do all the work to, to maintain that. But so I think these are things that feminist principles and feminist organizing tactics and strategies and understandings of the world can really uh, bring to this work. Yeah, that, that's great. The, um, the idea of not being um, trapped by an existing structure that has a predetermined outcome is just pivotal in so much of our work. And that sort of loops back, it folds back to a question asked by, by Kath Keeney in the, in the chat. She, Scott, has reminded uh, me that before Javaluka, um, you were uh, creative, well, you're still a creative, but you were a graphic designer. Um, and we loved you because all the stuff suddenly started to look a whole lot sharper and better and <laughs> contemporary and funky, but, and for other reasons too, Scott. Um, but uh, how important is creativity? How important is the imagination in campaign and advocacy work? I, I think it's really central, isn't it? Um, 
it was sort of what I was riffing on before in response to, I think what Dimity had asked is, I can creativity and a part of its genius was seeing something that others hadn't seen and then trusting it and trusting yourselves to actually go out, take a bit of a risk and press it. Extinction Rebellion's genius is to step outside of the designated protest zone and say, we're going to go over here exactly where you say we're not allowed to be. They just set up a gigantic pink table in the centre of London, speaking of coming to the table. Um, the school strikers innovation and creativity is I'm just not going to go to school until the actions match the rhetoric. So I think otherwise what we end up doing is what we've done before, which might have served us well, we end up marching around in a circle in the designated protest zone and then heading home. Um, we have to break out of that. It's still, I still will go to the march around the circle when, when one gets organized, but we have to innovate. We have to invent new forms um, because the, the system and the state is actually really quite good at working out how to neutralize and pull the radical sting out of some of our tactics. If we don't continually innovate, um, we just end up going around in circles. Mm. Um, Ray, you earlier, on the sort of notion of creative responses. You spoke about art in New Mexico when you were talking about the New Mexico experience. Um, I suppose the same question to you, how important is creativity, finding new audiences and, and forums, how important is the imagination in our work? I think imagination is, is crucial. And I think, you know, part of, Part of the reason why the the world is the way it is, why the the power structure operates the way it does, is because people are so conditioned to accept it. And the first step towards so much of this work, any any really social justice work, is is to unleash our minds and uncage our imaginations and imagine what might be possible if we were to work together. And we can look to lessons of the past of change that's been accomplished, but also imagine that we can do it again, which I think is is harder. We can recognize that, oh yes, people have made progress in past times. And um, you know, I've heard many people say, uh that oh you know social social movements don't work anymore I, I don't even know what that means um but i think there's there's this general sense that um that everything is 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 futile resistance is futile and i don't believe that and i think that creativity and imagination are crucial for getting through that first hurdle, our own blocks internally towards even trying to make a difference in the world and then operating collectively to do so, to make sure we don't fall back into those patterns of, of disbelief. Beautifully said, both of you. Um, um, there's another question here from Kate Analo. Hi. Um, how can we retain focus and integrate the many really important campaigns worldwide at the moment? There is so much going on. And so how do we maintain that focus? Who would like to go first on that one? You both avoiding it? No, go. <laughs> no, I can, I can go. I was just, just trying to be polite. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about this and 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 looking at the the connections between all of our movements and I get really excited about that. Um, I don't really see it as um, unfocused, I guess I see it all as um, opposition to state violence in its many, many forms. Um, and so whether we're talking about um you know uh land back um movements and um pipeline prevention like line three work going on right now in the us or standing rock or um what's Woten, um in what's known as canada um or if we're talking about uh open borders and immigration justice if we're talking about anti-war work and anti-nuclear weapons work um anti-war on terror um, and how that relates to immigration justice um, and how also that relates to the carceral system, particularly here in the United States, but also in Australia 
um, where there's a connection between, you know, uh, migration detention and the carceral system and who it's targeting. Um, the companies that are involved in all of these structures of violence are very interrelated. Sandia Nuclear Weapon Labs is involved in militarizing the U.S.-Mexico border. I mean, there's, there's, and this, this goes, that's one example, but it's just endless examples of the, of who's profiting from all of this. And then that, of course, ties in directly to movements for anti-capitalism, for degrowth, um, and for environmental change and protection. And so all of our work is connected. And I think that more important than, you know, trying to, I'm not a believer in trying to get everybody to do one thing, but I think that in all of our work, we need to respect that there's other work going on and we need to not undermine that work. And we need to understand the analysis that is being used in those movements for abolition of these various structures. And we need to incorporate that analysis um, into our own work and understand how we relate to one another and how we can support one another in that work um, in a way that will, will not necessarily bring everyone together in a happy, clappy family, but that is going to be ultimately supportive of getting to our overarching goal, which is um, to abolish state violence. Yeah, absolutely. Scott, what about you? There we go. The dreaded mute. Um, it's such a it's such a great question because I suppose it does manage to span the the personal and the and the planetary. On the personal side, I would say find one, find a niche find a place that you just love to be and give it a bit of time don't expect results quickly but just find a niche and plug in and i say that only because that was my experience of i'm not a political person i don't have a clue about anything but i can design a website for an anti-nuclear group please put me to work okay and of course they they did so find love to do and that you can be supported in doing. And that um, it, that's a great feeling in itself. From the planetary side, I wanna give a shout out to an organization or a network called the Progressive International. And I don't know how many folk would have come across it, but it's a group that I've had some involvement with for the last year or so, which sort of frames itself as a global organizing lattice. It's not a new social movement, but it's like a supportive connecting, connective tissue, scaffolding, for social movements, grassroots movements, and some um, left political parties and some NGOs, although not so much on the NGO side, um, right around the world. It's a really fascinating experiment in, um, in answering that question of like, how do we, we don't have to prioritize all these different struggles, the different dimensions of the same struggle, but how do we make sense of this incredible complexity? That's it's one of my favorite examples of people doing that and just acting as a kind of clearinghouse in a way that hasn't really happened um, in my lifetime. So I'm gonna I'll put the link to them in the chat. Actually, I'm gonna do that. That is great. And the, there's a bit of action in the chat. There's a uh, a comment and a briefing paper from David Noonan about uranium and the linkage of not supplying uranium to nuclear weapons state very important body of work. Um, a comment about uh, from Frank Hutchinson about the importance of, of imagining the future, which you've spoken about the importance of vision and imagination. The other thing that's happening in the chat is Zimity, along with Jim, has put in a whole bunch of uh, lists and connections um, to uh, both Ray and Scott's books um, with special discounts, 30% off and all that sort of stuff, which means you get the footnote and the acknowledgements for free. So it's bargain, um, check it out, do it if you can. And just my final question to you two fine folks is um, uh, is also talking about books. It's about books. Like, are you up for putting the toe back in the water? Is it too early? Would you go again? Are there any further plans for future books to the extent that you contracts can allow? Please comment. Um, not. Not from me, I wanna spend, even though the pandemic's making it really difficult, I'm, I was intending to spend the next um, year at least in trying to help promote this one. So thanks to ICANN and to 
Jam and Dim and Dave and everybody for that opportunity at the very least. I, I feel like it's more important to, um, yeah, try and help get that one out into the world first before I would think about going back to the shed for another three years. Um, I, I went into the metaphorical shed and wrote another book already, um, which will be published by Haymarket Books, I hope, maybe end of this year, maybe early next year, and I sort of just gave the spiel about it. It's called Abolishing State Violence, A World Beyond Bombs, Borders and Cages. Um, so you've gotten the preview here on this call today of, of what it's going to be about. Um, yeah, so that was that was a much, I would say, a much faster write. It started as um, you know, short, shorter essays I was writing for for a Wilp blog during the pandemic and um, turned into a, a book. So and big shout out and thanks to Haymarket for running with that one. That is very exciting, very timely um, from both of you. More ideas and and existing ideas more propelled into the universe. Great stuff. Very heartening and inspiring and for us very hopeful. We're really grateful for your work and for your efforts and for your advocacy and for the energy that you bring to what you're doing. Yeah, indeed, Dave. Um, we're coming towards the end of our lovely little get together today on the band school. And um, like Dave, I'm just really grateful to both of you for joining us, especially Ray over there on the other side of the world. Um, sitting up at night and all of you for joining us sharing your lunches with us and um, and being a part of this band school was started up as as a bit of what I think you said earlier Ray you know that band school was about trying to not presume that we were all on the same page so we wanted to go back and we wanted to check in with people and have these conversations with people that was the idea of band school make sure that we were actually putting things across that maybe people wanted to understand a bit more deeply and, and we weren't presuming knowledge and so forth. And this, uh, this one particularly has just really opened up a, a, a richness of the complexities and the, and the beauty and the internal logic of our movement. So thank you so much. It's been incredible. A, a massive sweep of history and history You know, those interlinkages between movements and times and imagination. And Dave reminded me, that um, today in 1963 in the United States, this was the day that Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. gave his iconic I have a dream speech in front of tens of thousands of people. And in that speech, he had, um, you know, it was obviously a speech about racial justice, human rights, and, and there was so much in that speech that was so precious. But as we were talking today, I was really thinking about this line that he had there that this is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. And I think that that's something that's so true today in so many movements, still in the, in the Black Lives Matter movement, most definitely, but in our movement as well around nuclear weapons, even having achieved the entry into force, you know, it's still such an important thing that we don't just cool off now, but we keep going and going hard. 40 years ago, also at this time, there was a bunch of women who were marching on their way to Greenham, as, as Ray um, pointed out as well, and to protest against nukes on common land. So as a final moment together, I just wanted to check in. Reading your books gives us that sense of that long history, history of our movements and hope. But do you have a final message in closing on the importance of the continuity and that vision beyond the now? Do either of you have a, a statement? Both of you have a statement on that. Scott, um, what about you? I, yeah, no, I, I just mute. I don't want. So. I, I I don't want this to finish up. That's my my <laughs> final thought. Is we got all these gorgeous people together. Now we're all going to go, and that's that's a bit shit. It's been lovely to see everybody. So take a little rest, take a beat, and then let's get back to work. What about you, Ray? Uh, what Scott said, definitely. Um, I guess, yeah, I think the, the longer view is really important for, for everything that we do because I think people, um, especially young folks coming into the work, 
um, you know, the ban was was a success. We got a treaty, we got a Nobel Peace Prize in the same year. That's not normal. That doesn't usually happen. Um, and so I think understanding the long arc of change is very, very important. Um, not just to know what's been tried before, because we can try things again in different ways, but to understand that this is a, a long term process that we're not going to see the end of, but the importance, the value of what we can contribute to something that's much bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm.